This is a CBC News special presentation. It is a shameful chapter in this country's history, a legacy that still touches generations of Indigenous families. The National Center for Truth and Reconciliation says more than 4,000 children died in residential schools that we know of. Some estimates are much higher, but often stories and names get lost in the numbers. Today, we will hear some of those stories and remember those who died and those who survived. We will hear from elders and survivors and pause to reflect on this country's past while honoring what residential schools once tried to take away, Indigenous identity, language, and culture. Hello there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Welcome to our special coverage of the third annual day of Truth and Reconciliation. We're coming to you here live from Parliament Hill. And in a few moments, we will take you to the event behind me that will pay tribute to all of those who have been affected and impacted by the residential school system. A reminder that this day, the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, fulfills one of the calls to action from uh, the Reconciliation Commission to create this day as a moment to think about the children who were taken, who didn't come back, and of course, the many people who survived the residential school system. Let's bring in Olivia Stefanovic, who's been talking to people in the crowd through the morning uh, and has some thoughts about being here on this day and what people are telling her, Olivia. Well, Rosie, the location of this event is significant. It's taking place at the heart of Parliament Hill, surrounded by the buildings of Parliament, where the residential school policy was born more than a century ago. And the Canadian flag on the Peace Tower is at half-mast to honour all the children who never returned home. And Rosie, while these institutions were called schools, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission says they were, they were developed to indoctrinate Indigenous children into the Euro-Christian Canadian society. And many people here say they are remembering that pain but this is also a day of resilience. Okay, Olivia, thank you for that. We'll come back to you, of course, through, uh, through this event and after it. But I want to bring in Brett Forrester of CBC's Indigenous Unit. Brett, good to see you. Tell me, it's only the third official day, although we've all come to grips in different ways as part of the reconciliation. Where, where would you say we are with reconciliation? Well, Rosie, you mentioned the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to actions off the top. Whenever I'm asked that question, I think of the words that then TRC Chair Murray Sinclair said in 2015 when he delivered that report. He said, we have described for you a mountain. We have shown you the way to the top but we call upon you to do the climbing. And I would say that despite some important symbolic actions and a noticeable change in rhetoric, we remain quite low on that mountain. We are, uh, there, there is, are people obviously that track those calls to action, the Yellow Hood Institute being Live one of them. The they say 13, uh, 13 of those calls have been completed, many more in progress, and many more still need some work. National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Just, I just wanted to be quiet there because there was a land recognition. Why don't we listen to the event and after we'll talk both to Brett, Olivia, uh, some of the survivors and some of the people that felt it was important to be here. This event is produced by the Aboriginal People's Television Network and the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation. We'll speak on the other side. Let's listen in. As we often do when we begin, we begin with ceremony. As members of our opening procession arrive to bear witness, they will bring them with them a very special object. This is a red cedar bentwood box. Handcrafted for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission by Coast Salish artist Luke Marston. This box was at all TRC events. And Luke, the artist, is with us again today, helping to carry the box he created to preserve the deeply personal items, each signifying healing and hope. Its faces reflect the distinct cultures of former First Nations, Inuit, and Métis students.
Nous aimerions maintenant inviter chef, le chef de la nation de Gitigan Zibi, Anishnabeg, à nous adresser la parole. Please welcome Chief Dylan White Duck and Councillor Frankie Cote. Good afternoon, everyone. To all Canadians and to all Indigenous peoples across this country. First, I'd like to acknowledge the Creator, my family, my council, my community, and acknowledge all First Nations people who were impacted by the residential school system. My name is Dylan White Duck, and I am the proud chief of a thriving Algonquin community called Kitigan Zibi Anishinaabe. I am humbled here to speak here today on our unceded, unsurrendered lands. It's important to recognize our people occupied this territory and lands for time immemorial and continue to do so today presently. This September 30th, 2023 marks the third National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. I applaud all First Nations people across Turtle Island who continue to be resilient, courageous, and prosperous. So miigwech. <laughs> Canada is taking some strides towards reconciliation. I'll admit that. But I challenge this country to do better. And I extend this challenge to all Canadians who know that they could do better. Let's never forget these important facts. Number one, First Nations people helped build this country dating back to the fur trade. Fact number two, we fought in many wars alongside you, and they were won because of our help. Fact number three, the treaties that were signed must be upheld with recognition and honor every day. And finally, number four, resources continue to be extracted from our, all of our First Nation territories across this country. Today, First Nation communities do have goals. We seek prosperity. We want a sustainable future, and we want our Indigenous languages back. But unfortunately, we are in a survival mode, and this is unacceptable. We ask you to help us achieve these goals. Let us all work towards economic reconciliation and reshape this great country, not for today, but for the next seven generations. On behalf of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe, I welcome you today. And let us always remember that every child matters. Miigwech kakana, and have yourself a great day, everybody. Chief White Duck and Councillor Kote. Our next speaker was recently appointed as the 15th Chancellor of the University of Ottawa, the very first Indigenous woman to hold that role. She is Algonquin from Kirigan Zibi Anishinaabe. Écoutons maintenant l'aîné Claudette Commanda. Survivors, families, communities, honored guests, Canadians, 
We gather here today remembering the children to honor, to respect, and to show love. We must come together in that sacred circle of life. We must come together in that sacred circle of prayer. We must come together in that sacred circle of love. The Creator has blessed us with voice, with spirit, and with heart to give honor to the Creator. Together with that one mind, one heart, one spirit, and one voice, let us acknowledge the Creator and we say, Chimigwech Kishimnado Migwech Kinakego. We thank the Creator for all of His blessings. We come together, brothers and sisters, to raise our voice with love and kindness, to say a prayer, our prayer of love, to all the survivors who are here with us, to all those survivors who did not return home, and to all the children, remembering the children. We thank the Creator for His love. To each and every one of you, beautiful people who are here in this circle, without love, there's no healing. And what each and every one of our survivors pray for as we say this prayer from our heart today, let us show that love to the survivors. And we thank the Creator for blessing us with such a beautiful day. As we thank our ancestors for always praying for us, for their prayer. Thank you for all of us being here today to say that prayer of love. And just remember, hope is free as the Creator's blessed us with hope. I love you all. I love you all. Chimigwech, Claudette Commanda, de nous avoir offert ces mots d'accueil. Nous aimerions également remercier les chanteurs Eagle River Singers, artistes algonquins de Kitiganzibi et du lac Barrière. Notre prochain invité est connu comme grand défenseur des droits autochtones et des droits de la personne. With a lifetime of accomplishments too numerous to list, Dr. Willie Littlechild has embodied tremendous leadership throughout his career as an accomplished lawyer, a respected politician, and exceptional athlete. Please welcome Dr. Willie Littlechild. Ganzen totentik, ni ganse manto, nete tamme hikmstehi, iko ka semina, esso imgo ahkenuts. Ka kio tetamskad na, epe no gota ik. Esa gihtoja, ma kaasti, et tegisksuta toajak, oasis, ega vahuskaja, ehkad nii ka nohtid. Hello, my friends and relatives. First, I want to express utmost gratitude to the Great Spirit in however way you acknowledge our Creator, God. A warm handshake of love and friendship to every one of you, especially because you came here to remember, to give tribute to the child spirit and to all youth who went before us on their spirit journey. I'm saddened this morning. I joined my sister in her last traveling song as he's dying today, a former residential school student. Very importantly, though, I also want to honor the survivors 
for your resilience, your courage, and your strength. You are thrivers. The challenge now is what do we do to have good relations? What do we do to restore respectful relationships? How do we advance true reconciliation? Your Excellencies, our Governor General Mary Simon and Vice Regal Consort Witt Fraser, thank you. Thank you for your much appreciated support in that collective effort. Pigo, kakame moyak, atoskewin, atoskatoyak. We must work together. Akame motan. We need to work harder than we can if we are to succeed. Finally, as a former Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner, I would encourage us to double our efforts in advancing reconciliation. How? Where there's hatred, let us sow love. Ita pagwatuin e itagok sa kito en opinetan. Where there's injury, pardon. Ita awiyak e usigohit. Mune itamatuin. Where there is doubt, faith. Ita epometamak. Tapwe kakyokiam. Tapwe tatan. Where there is despair, hope. Ita ekipaktemok. Akamemotan. For it is in giving that we receive. Ita hanma kawepinasoyak. Kami gosiak, ay ay, naskum na. No remercima a Dr. Willie Littlechild. Kina naskum it n. Thank you. Nous aimerions prendre un moment pour souligner l'engagement des nombreux partenaires diffuseurs qui participent à cette journée importante. Isu main nak upi kusuk kaluak cukup karena temionir ilah hagiak isu anit isu isu anut. We are very proud to see Canadians from coast to coast to coast come together on this day of honor, as we honor the survivors and grieve the profound impacts of genocide. But we are still far from implementing all of the 94 calls to action as outlined by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we have yet to see every province mark this day as an official statutory holiday. Notre premier artiste vient également de Kitiganzibi Anishinaabeg, où il a appris à jouer du violon avec son oncle et en observant ses parents. Although the years he spent at St. Mary's Residential School that took much away from him, he was able to return to his community and to the music that has never left him. Please welcome Eddie Pazenawaj Kote. Anyway, uh, I, uh, I was in uh, residence school for many years, months, years, you know, then I didn't forget, you know, every time I speak my language over there, I couldn't, speak, I couldn't talk for four years, five years, so there, today um, I'm glad to see all the schnobs, you know, no? they're from the Gonzivi especially. There's my partner, Tim White Duck is my, my partner for the music, he has been with me for a while, so we, we're going to do that. So uh, all the ones that sit in front of me says, this is all this, you no, know, I hope you guys get up and die. But it's going to be a short one, though. I don't That's going to be a kind of sad song. That's the one I wrote. I call it residential school song.
Rich. Thank you, Eddie. Present the watch, Kote, for that beautiful performance. Mm -hmm. Provenant du territoire Mi'kmaq, notre prochaine invitée est une ambassadrice hors pair pour sa communauté et une véritable championne de justice sociale. She is third generation survivor. She is land defender. She is water protector, water walker, cultural teacher, grandmother, and so much more. Her work focuses on education and environmentalism through indigenous perspectives. Please welcome Doreen Bernard. My spirit name is I Love My Indian Ways. I'm Otter Clan. I'm Sebagenegri in Mi'kma'ki. Well, Alan, Elder Commander, for your beautiful prayer, my fellow survivors and families and leaders, medicine people, Her Excellency, Governor General Mary Simon, and the Senators Francis, Baptiste, and Prosper, and all government members, and special guests, and to all the survivors who are joining us here and across Canada and beyond. Well, Aliak, thank you for being here, to be with us to bear witness to this third National Day of Truth and Gen Reconciliation, to honor the survivors of the Indian residential school institutions in Canada. We honor and we remember all those who are now our ancestors watching over us in the spirit world. We are here because you survived genocide. We honor and remember Migwi Datamik, the children who died in the Indian residential school institutions, the missing children who never came home, and the children who have been found, the ones that we are still searching for. We will never forget you. We honor all the trailblazers who started the well-briety movements to battle addictions and help people to learn to love themselves and creator again. We honor all who preserved our vitalized, revitalized our, our cultures and our languages, our traditions and our ceremonies to help us to heal traumas and to learn to live good life. We honor all who stand to protect our indigenous rights and human rights and Mother Earth and the water for our future generations, all our, all our Nogoma. We honor all those who broke down those barriers to education, to teach our true history of indigenous peoples that was erased for generations. The historians, the authors, the poets, the artists, the professionals, all who ins inspire us today we honor the courage of survivors who led the fight for justice to speak our truth, to tell Canada and the world we survived genocide. We honor the survivors and all our descendants who are struggling with the impacts of residential schools today. We honor all those who stand with us, who work and help and support us. Well, Aliak. I honor my mom and my family and my children and grandchildren and send my love to you today. Msit Nogama, all my relations. Well Alan. Nakumi, Elder Doreen Bernard for your beautiful message. Nous invitons maintenant la directrice exécutive du Centre National pour la Vérité et la Réconciliation à nous adresser la parole. Please welcome Stephanie Scott. Buju, good afternoon. Miskwa Nakwadakwe, Indigenakaz, Wabashishi Dodem, Winnipeg Dunji, Treaty One Territory. I am the daughter of a survivor, and I am also a 60 Scoop survivor. 
I'd like to say thank you to Chief Dylan White Duck for welcoming us to the unceded lands of the Algonquin Nation and Elder Commanda for the beautiful prayer. I say miigwech to all First Nations, Métis, Inuit survivors. We are here today because of you and your strength and your courage. There would have not been an apology. There would not have been a Truth and Reconciliation Commission or a National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation. Survivors insisted the truth of residential schools must never be forgotten. The National Day for Truth and Reconciliation is a day to honour all Indigenous survivors who are with us and those children who died in those institutions. We must respect all survivors, amplify their voice and call out the deniers. We must challenge the people who don't want to face the truth. The residential school system was intended to destroy First Nations, Inuit and Métis cultures and our languages, but they did not succeed. For those that never made it home, their spirits call out to us to be remembered and to be honoured. We have a powerful symbol of those truths. The National Student Memorial Register carries the names of 4,140 names of children identified through the records in the NCTR's care and the statements of their families. Our research is ongoing. We still don't have all the records. The NCTR continues to work with churches, governments, and others so we can finally access the 23 million records that were not released to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. We know more children will be found and their names will be added. The memorial banner was created through sacred ceremony, and we are sharing it here today in that same spirit. As the banner is lifted, some of our special guests will honour the children and show their commitment to this important act of remembrance. They will place shoes on the stage to represent the children whose stories have yet to, been, to be told, but whose in spirits we honour. I'd like to introduce Métis artist Bry Moran, founding director of the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation, to perform his song, Feel You Here During the Procession. Thank you and miigwech. to those souls who've passed whose world didn't last we're here to sing your song Although you may be gone, I feel you here. I feel.
to the trees and to the sea. Je te sens ici. I feel you
<laughs> Thank you, Stephanie Scott. Thank you, Roy Moroyan. You had us crying. It's okay to cry. Thank you for that. We needed that. That was a beautiful performance. Notre prochain invité est né à Port Resolution, au bord du lac Great Slave. Fier membre de la nation métisse de l'Alberta, elle est récipiendaire de nombreuses reconnaissances, notamment la médaille du jubilé de diamant de la reine Elisabeth II et le prix du gouverneur général. She is a decorated leader and tireless advocate for her community and beyond, from friendship centers to regional councils, from children's care to elders' care. Dunga Suktitaura Pili, Elder Angie Kriar. On February 29th, 1880, a letter from Bishop Grandin was addressed to the Canadian government. Bishop wrote, if you bring us 100 Indians and half-breeds to the mission, where they leave our convent, they would no longer be Indians. They would become good citizens earn a good living, and be useful to their country. And so it began, as across Canada, from coast to coast, our children were taken from their families. The opening of the residential school started the most tragic, destructive, and separation of the Native people and loss of our values and culture. We were witness to the darkest time in Canada's history. As a usual, many thousands and thousands of our people have suffered from addiction, sexual abuse, depression, and personal relationships. We were savages and had to embrace the white man's way of life and language. We have paid a high price for our years in res residential school. And the nuns used to leave us and leave us and tell us, I left my home, my country, my family to teach you savages, and you must forgive everything that your parents were taught, or you, would, you are full of sin and you'll go to hell. The horror, heartaches, and pain, which reached down for generations and is today, we suffered and endured cruelly in depression, crying for the loss of our language, values, and culture, which has left us a legacy of loss at so many levels. The two main objectives of the federal government were, number one, to remove the children from the influence of their home, families, traditions, and culture, to teach them to accept the nominant society. They assumed that our culture, our language, and spiritual beliefs were inferior. And to educate us, they had to kill the the Indians, 
Sorry. They had to kill the Indian of the child. We must admire and respect the, reson the resilience of these children, which endured and survived. And we are still here, a proud people. A proud people who could not be destroyed, but at what cost? We learn to kiss away the tears and walk away the fears. Truth and uh, reconciliation is a walk of generations and a lifetime. Be kind to one another. Respect each other in values and traditional ways. Forgive and let love rule your day. But all, for we are never victims. We are survivors. Nakukmik Elder Angie Kriar, we thank you for sharing your story with all of us. Notre prochain invité est originaire de Machteouillas, dans la région du Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean, au Québec. Elle a consacré sa vie à la transmission des connaissances culturelles aux prochaines générations et est une ambassadrice incontournable pour sa communauté. Voici maintenant Telesh Bégin. J'ai encore beaucoup de difficultés à parler de mon passage pensionnant indien après tant d'années. Je n'ai même jamais parlé à mes parents ni à mes grands-parents. La peur de brimer leur confiance envers Dieu, envers les représentants de l'Église, les représentants aussi. Aujourd'hui, je suis mère de trois enfants, grand-mère de neuf petits-enfants, un petit-fils arrière et un autre qui va naître bientôt. Je suis ici aujourd'hui pour leur lancer un message d'espoir. Je ne veux pas, surtout pas, leur laisser un héritage de mes blessures, de mon passé, évidemment. Je veux les laisser quelque chose de bien, soit l'espoir d'un meilleur avenir pour nos nations, pour me libérer de ce que je garde beaucoup trop longtemps dans mon cœur et dans ma tête. profonde conviction de mon aide. Je l'affirme, conviction que la plus haute société du Québec et du Canada, ainsi que tous les Canadiens et les Canadiennes, entendront et comprendront mon message d'espoir. C'est ma vérité. Malgré ce que j'ai vécu, aux passionnants. Que cet espoir de nos relations en nous, une grande nation, soit plus égalité et respectueux des droits de chacun. Je ne veux pas que mes enfants et mes petits-enfants Vive que ce que j'ai vécu. Jamais nous oublierons ces enfants qui n'ont pas eu la chance de retourner, trouver leurs parents, leurs proches. C'est pourquoi je vous livre ce message d'espoir aujourd'hui. Ce n'est que maintenant, ni une télé, je vous aime.
Chinesh Kumitin pour ce partage et votre grande sagesse aînée, Telesh Bejin. Growing up in Treaty One territory in Manitoba, our next performer has kept strong her ties to her Métis heritage and her homeland. Cette connexion identitaire influence grandement sa démarche artistique, comme nous sommes à la veille de l'entendre. Voici l'auteur, compositrice, interprète Willows. Bon après-midi. Nos territoires font partie de nous. Les grandes plaines, les lacs, les forêts et les rivières qui coulent dans nos veines. Je crois que nous portons cette connexion forte dans nos cœurs, partout où nous allons. Mes ancêtres, tout comme plusieurs familles de la nation métisse, ont été séparés de leur famille et de leur communauté et ont perdu leur terre quand le gouvernement canadien a mis en place le système des certificats, le SCRIP system. C'est en français et en métier français que j'ai composé cette chanson pour les, pour les honorer et qui parle de la liberté d'être qui nous sommes. What a beautiful performance. Nakuk Meek, Willows. In 1947, near the small village of Kainsualujuak, Nunavik, Her Excellency, the Right Honorable Mary Simon, Governor General of Canada, and her siblings went to an English only Federal Day School in Kujuak. From grades one through six, Mary Simon and her classmates would be punished any time they spoke Inuktitut, the ancestral language of our mother tongue and her Inuk mother. Leaving this establishment to be homeschooled from then on was, in her words, probably the best thing that's happened to me. Here now with her message of remembrance and reconciliation, we invite Her Excellency, the Right Honorable Mary Simon, Governor General of Canada.
kulakut tunga sugici ilunasi haisi mayusi welcome everybody and good morning elders elder claudette commander thank you for your prayer survivors Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner, Dr. Willie Littlechild. We just had a little chat in the back and we both said, we've been at this for a long time and we're still here. <laughs> Welcome to our indigenous leaders, Natan Obed, ministers, dignitaries, and our youth, shares invite, bonjour. I am thankful for the welcome and teachings the elders of this unceded territory are sharing with us today and every time we gather on these lands, so thank you. I'm grateful to be here with all of you today to mark the third national day for truth and reconciliation, a day of reflection and action. Je suis honoré d'être ici avec vous aujourd'hui. I was, had so many emotions going through me when I was uh, watching the, me the memorial cloth banner. It's a visual impact of how many kids actually didn't get come back home. So what stories do we want to tell our children? This is, of course, the history of Canada as told for the longest time of explorers and discoveries of taming a, a wild land of settlements and confederation. But as time has passed, Canadians have come to realize that this version of history is not complete. Canada's history is so much more than that. It should reflect Indigenous histories. Certainly our national history needs to reflect the challenges, trauma, joys, experiences, knowledge and culture of Indigenous peoples and lives. For years, Indigenous people have been telling their stories. I am here to tell you today, Canada as a country is beginning to listen to those stories. And as you know, Many of those stories have been devastating. We are gathered today to remember those stories, the stories of children taken from their homes, not just from their homes, but from their families and loved ones. The stories of the children represented in the shoes we see today on stage Every shoe here honors the survivors of residential schools. Every shoe here commemorates the children who never made it back to their families. And for some that came home, never saw their parents again, because they had passed on while they were away. These children who lie in unmarked graves across this country were never forgotten by their families nor their communities. And of course, we have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report that has calls to action 
and I know people are working on those calls to action, but I just wanted to say that in addition to these reports, including missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, the unmarked graves of the children woke this country up. So I often get asked to define reconciliation. Reconciliation is a complex issue. It's complex because survivors have their own experiences and need to heal in their own time. Reconciliation is complex because there are many levels of work that is required, both at the community, within the country across, and at the political level. Sa quoi la reconciliation? Ce n'est pas une réponse facile, mais pour moi. La reconciliation, c'est simplement la respect. Reconciliation is a way of saving and living life. It is about beginning intentional, being intentional in how we interact with one another, how we show respect, how we get rid of racism, how we make space to respect each other and our cultures. It means equality in the country for all especially Indigenous people who have suffered immeasurably without the type of services that we in other parts of the country take for granted. It's a time to get to know each other. It's a time to tell our stories, a time to exchange and tell each other who we are so that in the end we will learn as a people of this country to be the type of people we want to be. The power of education is powerful. Truth is powerful. So when we talk about reconciliation, it, we, we want the education system to embrace and teach the indigenous history and, and our lives and, and also to support our indigenous languages. Education isn't just about the academic side. Education is about our way of teaching as well, indigenous ways of teaching. And that needs to be addressed also in our education system. And I know that it is, it's happening in different parts of the country, so I'm not saying that it isn't happening, but need a, we need a more unified system of how we give the full story of Canada, especially in relation to Indigenous and First Peoples of this country. I have been traveling quite a lot since I became uh, Governor General over two years now, and I am seeing every day how complex it is, what is confronting us as a country, how complex it is. And when I travel across the country, I don't just stay in the city and meet with government representatives. I also go out to remote areas and communities to talk to them about their issues and their concerns and how they see reconciliation. And I've been recently to um, a place in Nova Scotia where uh, there was a, a, a house that provided support and services to young people. And they deal with their trauma and their healing through art. So this is one of the things that it is also important in our country. So yesterday, when I hosted an event at Rideau Hall, where we had a wonderful indigenous artist, Meryl McMaster, she showed all the students that were there how to use art to learn more 
about the full history of our country and to share their hopes and dreams for a world where every child matters. Reconciliation is hope. Hope that we are building together a future that is free from racism, harm, prejudices, exclusion, and violence, and injustices. Everything that has marked the lives of Indigenous people for centuries. But we must also remember how Indigenous people are working not only through their um, well-being, but we Indigenous people are also working with non-Indigenous Canadians. They're developing partnerships, building better communications and better communities. It takes a long time for these things, and I understand and fully sympathize with those that are at home in small communities are continuing to suffer the inequities. Services that we have, health services, mental health support, uh, education that's relevant to their culture and language. And I think that it's really important to remember that even though we are making progress on bigger issues, it's not necessarily having an impact at the community level. So I think we must think more about how we as leaders agree on things that we should also think about. So how is that going to impact people at the community level? So on this National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, let us all go forward with hope and ayuinata. Ayuinata in my language in Inuktitut means never give up, no matter what. Let us go forward with the children in our hearts and minds. Let us support the families. And let us walk this journey of reconciliation together, one step at a time. Marchons ensemble sur le chemin de la réconciliation, un pas à la fois. So thank you so much for having me today. I am with you. Thank you. Nankov Mek, Son Excellence, la très honorable Mary Simon, Gouverneur général du Canada. Notre prochain invité dédie depuis longtemps ses efforts à la santé des nations autochtones de sa région. Our next speaker is a proud Coast Salish. He is a decorated actor and physician who was until recently the Deputy Chief Medical Officer at Indigenous Services Canada. In his new role as Acting Associate Dean in the new medical school at Simon Fraser University, he continues to be a tireless advocate for First Nations health and well-being and a respected voice and leader for the LGBTQS plus community. Mesdames et Messieurs, voici Dr. Evan Adams. I am an intergenerational survivor. My parents met and fell in love in residential school, the Seychelles Residential School, in 1953. And my parents had 69 and three quarter years together. My father bitterly called residential school a prison and my mother can barely stand to talk about what happened to her. But the few times she has talked about residential school, she talked about meeting my dad and falling in love. Today we remember and we must talk about what happened to those tens of thousands of Indigenous children, including my parents, subjugated, humiliated, stripped of love and care, state and church-sanctioned violations against them that we all must now live with. 
It is incomprehensible that adults would do that to any child, and it will be unbearable that we will be disinterring unmarked graves, identifying children via their bones and DNA, lest they be erased forever. And that we, those of us still here, must contend with what has come to pass. I was an honorary witness for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but I am also a son. I am here and not with my mother, but I was with her when she identified dozens of unidentified children in photographs at the Roman Catholic archives. My sisters are at home with her, hopefully holding her hand, and we are holding the memory of our dear father between us. We collectively quell our rage, soften our hearts, and we hold each other close. It is a good day for healing. It is always a good day for healing. As we uphold survivors across the country, like my mother, let us also remember those who did not make it home, those who are no longer with us, and let us call our spirits back to us. And let us also remember the imperative to love one another. Imut, Marci, Ekomik. Aujourd'hui, nous souhaitons souligner le rôle indispensable qui joue les intervenants dans le domaine de la santé, notamment les professionnels, les bénévoles et les aînés qui appuient les survivants à tous les jours, et ce, à travers le pays. With heartfelt gratitude, we honor the contributions of Resolution Health Support and Cultural Support workers. From mental health counseling to emotional and cultural support services, these health practitioners have made healing possible. Many have been on the front lines of care for decades since before the 2006 Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. Throughout the Truth and Reconciliation Commission process, the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and beyond. And now I invite the very talented Mi'kmaq songstress Emma Stevens to commemorate these heroes with a special performance. Good. Thank you, and I'm honored to be here today. I dedicate this honor song to every person whose name is listed behind me, and to so many others who continue to offer healing and support to survivors and families. Let us take a moment to acknowledge the Resolution Health Support and Culture Support workers that are present here today. I invite them to stand so we may honor them. Me dead am an edge, don't tell you no nigga must you came away down Get me dead am an Away, 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 away
Merci, Emma Stevens, pour cette très belle performance. Notre prochain invité est membre de la nation de Picogan, de l'Abitibi-Témiscamingue. Artiste ainsi que guide en nature et en culture, il est fier ambassadeur de sa communauté et de sa langue. Accueillons chaleureusement Normand Kistabich. Je disais tout simplement que vous êtes bien beau en orange aujourd'hui, puis euh, que faisait beau, puis. Euh, je voudrais dire peut-être merci pour ça et hey, hey, notre température est avec nous autres. Pour faire une courte histoire de ce que je pensais de dire, de ce que je pensais vraiment dire, il est tout oublié. <rire> je pensais à 4h30 à matin, c'est ça, je vais dire telle chose, telle chose. Puis euh, à 6 heures, je me lève. Je l'avais déjà oublié. Que... <rire> je parle français parce que c'est la seconde langue que j'ai appris. Je ne comprenais pas français. Je ne comprenais pas que mon nom, c'était Norman Christabus quand je suis rentré au pensionnat. On m'a toujours appelé Moni. Moni, c'est parce que j'avais un chien qui s'appelait Moni. <rire> Puis en plus, de plus, quand j'ai appris que je m'appelais Norman Christabich, ils m'ont mis de côté pour me donner un numéro. 1, 2, 3, 123. Puis là, j'ai vécu tout ça de... <coughs> Les séquelles du pensionnat sont tellement terribles là, que je vais mettre ça de côté parce que ça fait plusieurs fois que, que je que j'ai parlé, que je me suis soigné de ça, en ayant un vécu pas tellement exemplaire. Moi aussi, je me suis tombé dans l'alcool, la, la drogue, dans le sexe, étant un abusé du sexe par les... Euh, ceux qui étaient supposés nous montrer les... Les enseignements du celui qui appelle Dieu, je ne sais pas comment, qu'il l'appelait exactement, je ne comprenais pas dans ce temps-là. Avant que je décide d'aller, d'apprendre le français, de m'y appliquer, c'est quand j'ai décidé que je voulais plus avoir de traitement physique. On a vécu toutes sortes de 
de conséquences, d'humiliation. Juste pour donner un exemple, il y avait deux garçons à peu près de mon âge dans ce temps-là qui faisaient pipi au lit. Puis là, ces, ces enfants-là, ils se faisaient fouetter tous les matins. Puis nous autres, on était en rang, l'un à côté de l'autre, impuissants, pris dans une... Ça, ça fait mal de le voir, puis on ne pouvait rien faire. C'est terrible. J'ai beaucoup d'amis ici de Picogan, de parenté, mes frères, et mon frère puis mes soeurs, des amis que je vois leur face, cousins, cousines. Je voudrais remercier Guy Pijak. Tu me dis, tu me dis, tu me dis, tu me dis, tu me dis. Je n'ai pas perdu ma langue quasiment, par exemple. Quasiment. Je suis retourné dans le bois pour le réapprendre. Avec mes beaux-parents, qui malheureusement sont partis. Avec frères et sœurs, beaux-frères qui m'ont montré comment ça s'appelle les arbres, les sortes d'arbres, le boulot, l'érable, et toutes ces, toutes ces sortes d'arbres, de, de, les résineux, et même les noms des animaux. Je les connaissais un ou deux, mais pas, pas toute la gang. Puis ça, ça a un lien dans mon apprentissage de réapprendre ma langue. Aujourd'hui, ce que je fais pour le garder, j'écris. Je traduis ce que j'ai... Ça s'appelle les, les épisodes de documentaire sur le hockey. Ça, ça, le hockey, c'est un sport que j'ai aimé beaucoup, que j'étais. J'étais bon au hockey. J'ai même joué contre Guy Lafleur. <rire> Puis oui, à Québec. Puis c'est un mauvais pédant, ce gars-là. <rire> Des bouts de route de ma vie. <rire> c'est parce que moi, je suis allé deux fois à Québec jouer au hockey. Puis oui, première année avec les Indiens du Québec, qui nous appelaient, qui nous avaient ramassés dans Amashtou Yash pour pratiquer un mois de temps avec les, les nouveaux coéquipiers que je ne connaissais pas. Mais je les ai connus quand même euh, plus tard. Mais... Puis la deuxième année, c'était avec l'équipe d'Amos, d'où ce que je suis proche, là, où ce que le pensionnat était proche de, d'Amos en Abitibi. Pour faire une courte histoire de ce que j'ai vraiment vécu après, là, c'était terrible. Je n'ai pas été un exemplaire pour personne. J'ai fait toutes sortes de métiers. Tout ça de quasiment profession. J'ai été chef de ma communauté. J'ai été un agent de développement économique. J'ai allé travailler dans l'Ouest en tant que cuisinier. Je changeais de, de... J'ai toujours trouvé quand même... J'étais vraiment un survivant partout où ce que j'y allais. J'y apprenais, je rec... même mon anglais. <rire> I couldn't speak English. Eh? <rire> J'étais dans une immersion anglaise, toute seule dans le nord, dans un coin de... Tu sais, le pôle nord maléthique, on regarde dans le boussole, là. J'étais à 400 kilomètres, 400 000, pas kilomètres, 400 000. Puis là, il y avait juste de l'anglais, du monde qui parlait l'anglais. Qu'est-ce que je fais là-bas? Moi, il n'y a pas de ça. Hein? Qu'est-ce que je faisais là-bas? Ça, c'est dans ma recherche de fuir l'alcool, la drogue. Puis là-bas, où est-ce que je suis allé, il n'y avait pas là-bas. Puis là, je me trouvais comme... Je ne sais pas comment j'expliquerais ça. En même temps, insécure parce que j'étais en manque. Puis en même temps, je voulais arrêter. Puis toute seule, je... j'avais un combat continuel parce que je ne demandais pas de l'aide. Puis ça, 
En vieillissant, j'ai compris que j'avais besoin de l'aide. Comme la plupart de ceux qui sont allés au pensionnat qui ont fait la vie comme moi, là, vous me comprenez ce que je vais me dire, je pense. Puis ça, j'ai transmis ça à mes enfants. Puis euh, c'est un travail que je continue à faire, à essayer d'améliorer mon cheminement de guérison avec ma famille, ma communauté. C'est tout du monde que j'ai fait mal. Imaginez, j'ai été un chef de bande. Non? À la de les années, je voulais juste savoir, quand ils m'ont nominé pour être chef, je voulais savoir juste comment j'étais populaire. <rire> j'ai dit oui. Puis j'ai battu mon adversaire écrasé. Je ne veux, veux pas être fier, 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 fier de ça, là, mais c'est arrivé que j'ai gagné. Puis dans ce temps-là, on commençait à prendre en charge les programmes qu comme l'éducation, l'administration, la santé, tranquillement, dans mon village. Au moins, ce bout-là, je l'ai fait. Et ça a continué, puis ça continue encore aujourd'hui. On n'a pas fini, non? Non, quelqu'un de Je voudrais dire merci de m'écouter. Parce que ce que, ce que vous entendez, moi, ça me fait sortir des choses que je regardais, que je ne voulais pas dire, puis ça, je vous le donne. Ça vous appartient. Ça nous appartient parce que vous, ça sort de moi. Ça. Puis vous êtes bien dans bout, assis devant tout orange. C'est-tu bien gratuit, Jimmy Gwich, Normal our final speaker has dedicated her life to the betterment of her community of Kangyaksinip, Rankin Inlet, and to Nunavut at large. Amongst her many accomplishments in healthcare and politics, she helped establish the Rankin Inlet Birthing Center. She was the first woman mayor for Rankin Inlet and was MLA for her region in the Legislative Assembly of Nunavut from 2004 to 2008. De plus, son travail communautaire acharné continue à porter fruit encore aujourd'hui. Veuillez accueillir Dr. Lavinia Brown. Koyanaming. <laughs> Hello to you all. My name is Lavinia Nokadla Brown. Inuktitl Nokadla means spider web. I'm a resident to school survivor from Rankin Inlet. I'm happy to be here today to share my truth with you. Sharing has always helped me work through the pain of resident to schools experience. I went to an institution in Chesterfield Inlet, Iglu It was a very scary place filled with sadness from all of us children who were forced to be there on and away from the families. I wasn't allowed to speak my language, Inuktitum. None of us. If I was caught, I was punished, beaten. We were all, and we didn't know English. So we barely speak at all. But we had each other. And we didn't often use words. How could we? 
There were no words. We were there for one another, trying to get through it together. I want to acknowledge that there were three strong Inuit survivors who bravely spoke to the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in 1987 about their experiences in resident to schools. They gave us a voice and they gave us courage to speak up of our experiences and how damaging they were. It is important that all of you and the future generation to know what happened to us and that you hear us and acknowledge how this affected Inuit people and other nations, other indigenous people and communities. But today I see change, especially with our young generation. They are working to regain their Inuit culture languages and tradition. And being here with you today and all those watching, it brings us hope, hope for healing, hope for reconciliation, and hope for a better future for the Inuit people and other in indigenous people. There's four words I'd like to leave with you. And the four words have four letters in them. Each one have four letters in them. Love, let's show more love. I see so many of you wearing orange, orange t-shirts, something orange. I appreciate that. Care, let's show more care for one another. Kind, let's use that word more and pass it on to everybody. Share, I told you that sharing always makes me feel better, always make me feel I have hope. And lastly, i like to thank the NCTR and staff for their hard work. Without them, I doubt if we would be here today. nos remerciements, Dr. Lavinia Brown, Miigwech, pour ce témoignage inspirant. Nous arrivons déjà à la fin du programme, mais avant de se quitter. Une dernière performance d'un artiste qui est, sans aucun doute, une des flèches montantes de sa génération grâce à la puissance de sa voix et de sa démarche artistique. Many of the songs on his first album were inspired by his grandfather, who shared his experiences as a survivor of Macintosh Residential School in Ontario.
Does it feel like we're on the edge? Staring down a certain day. But does it feel like the story ends before we start? We conclude this afternoon, much like we began, with ceremony. As we retire the Eagle Staff and Bentwood Box, nous vous invitons à rester sur les lieux encore un temps pour continuer cette commémoration ensemble. On behalf of the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, Nakourmik, for being here with us to honor residential school survivors and to remember those who did not make it home. And we encourage everyone to read the recommendations of the TRC because it's all up to us to make sure reconciliation isn't just an idea, but an action. Au nom du Centre national pour la vérité et la réconciliation, merci d'avoir participé aujourd'hui. Miigwech, Nyawangoa. And if I may, Madeline, Nakurmik to you, it's been a really wonderful moment getting to spend this moment with you again and hosting this wonderful event. Nakurmik. Merci beaucoup for you. I'm honored that they invited back us back uh, on stage this year. And uh, thank you, all of you, for being amazing uh, audiences in the beautiful sun. We go home darker than we came. <laughs> and we have an eagle circling the grounds earlier on today. Let's hope that by dancing together and sending a lot of good vibes up to the sky, the eagles will come back and visit us as we dance all together. Merci beaucoup à tous. Thank you. Okay, you have been watching special coverage of the third National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Uh, the first one created in 2021, but this one, the first time being held on Parliament Hill, 
Some very powerful moments there, um, as we heard from various survivors, elders, and the governor general, who said that she believes that the the um, unmarked graves of the children that were discovered in, in Kamloops, British Columbia, was a wake-up call to this country and got people thinking about how to practice reconciliation and how to bring it into their own lives. If you had difficulty watching anything that you saw here today, a reminder that there is support available. Uh, if you're a survivor of residential schools, that is the number that you can call at any time, the National Indian Residential School Crisis Line. That will help you, uh, and you should reach out to that if you need it, now or ever. And if you've just had a hard time listening to some of those stories, I encourage you to talk to people around you as well. Let me bring in Brett Forrester, who's been watching this with me. This is my first time. Uh, I mean, it's only the third one, but this is my first time at one of these events. I, I found it very powerful. Um, that, that moment where they brought out the commemorative banner with more than 4,000 names of children who, who died at those schools uh, was almost overwhelming. Yeah, it's important to breathe. Yeah. Just take a deep breath. Yeah. I have been to the first one of these and the second one. The emotions run high. The stories are powerful. And it's an important symbolic moment for me as well. Seeing yeah. that scarlet, blood red banner with the names of the children who never made it home unfurled and folded on stage was a powerful visual reminder of what we are all here to think about these weren't numbers these weren't statistics these were indigenous children and they deserved a chance at equality they deserved a chance to have prosperity a good life in canada and the country failed them in that uh, the second thing that stood out from the speeches was as you pointed out that really i thought candid and frank address from the governor general she said you know for example that the actions aren't trickling down to where they're having an impact on the grassroots community members but what really stood out to me from her speech was this idea that reconciliation means equality in the country for all. There's so many areas that remain unequal. These are child welfare, education, health care, infrastructure, access to justice. Uh, these are all areas that need to be addressed. They're in a crisis level situation. But beyond the speeches, what really stood out was just hearing indigenous languages being yeah, spoken. Yeah. This was a system that tried to ensure that these languages wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Many of them are extinct, or almost extinct, I should say. So just hearing those songs, hearing that language spoken uh, on yeah. stage. And also, and also just a, a, an overwhelming sense of hope, even from the survivors themselves who have been there, that there, they, there seems to be a desire that this country can get there, that, that we can make progress on this. I, I should tell you that Justin Trudeau was not at this event today, but he was, did make his way to La Range, uh, Saskatchewan, which is uh, quite a ways away from Saskatoon in northern Saskatchewan, uh, where he spent the day speaking to people there. He brought his uh, son, his youngest son, Hadrian, who's nine, as part of an effort to try and teach him about reconciliation. Let's listen to a little bit of the prime minister now. This is our country today that we need to be part of the path of reconciliation. We know well that the goal of residential schools at the time was to teach Indigenous kids that their language had no value, that their culture and their knowledge had no value, that their very identity had no value in this country and to this land. Fortunately, they failed. And we see incredible, strong Indigenous communities right across the country standing up, sharing the beautiful drum songs, taking pride in that traditional knowledge that is more important now as we are racked with the impacts of short-term thinking and climate change effects than ever before. We all need to learn some of the traditional knowledge that has led to stewardship of this land. But remember that even as every single residential school was teaching every single one of those Indigenous children that they had no value, every other school in this country was teaching all Canadians that Indigenous kids had no value, that Indigenous languages had no value, that Indigenous knowledge and culture and traditions 
weren't worth studying or learning or paying attention to. So don't ever let anyone tell you that reconciliation is just about indigenous people and governments. Reconciliation is the action and the responsibility of every single person who lives today on Turtle Island. Every single one of us have to understand not just what happened in the past, but the impacts that that past has in very real things today. Whether it's trauma, or addictions, or cycles of poverty, or marginalization. Those are the results of deliberate policies the governments of Canada and other orders of government took on. And that's why it's so important that every year we see more and more people wearing these orange shirts in honor of Phyllis Webstadt and of all Indigenous school survivors. It's why we gather in increasing numbers across the country to say this matters to recognize, not just as part of our past, but as an undeniable part of our present. And why everyone here today and everyone wearing an orange shirt across the country is putting up their hand to say, I am part of this healing process. That's the Prime Minister of Canada in Laurent, Saskatchewan. That is where he is spending today the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. The Conservative leader, the leader of the official opposition, Pierre Poiliev, came by this location, Parliament Hill, and uh, met with a few people earlier. We uh, managed to grab him on camera, and here's what he had to say about the importance of this day. Hi, Mr. Poiliev. Could you tell us what today means for you? Uh, I would just say it's a very special day uh, for all Canadians to reflect upon uh, uh, the wrongs done in the past and uh, to promote reconciliation uh, and to honour our the First Peoples from coast to coast to coast to coast. Thank you. How are your conversations like? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Obviously, politicians uh, wanting to show leadership on the uh, issue of reconciliation, but reconciliation comes in all different shapes and sizes and is something that has to happen uh, from all Canadians, not just Indigenous peoples. Um, and part of what we saw here today were people finding different ways to pay tribute and honour uh, those who ended up in the residential school system, those who did not make it. Emma Stevens was one of those people, a Mi'kmaq singer. You heard her uh, earlier this hour. Let's just take a little bit more of what of her wonderful performance and then we'll talk to her. Get me dead, I'm an edge. Don't tell Get me dead, I'm an edge. Down where the back so And Emma joins us now. Hi. Thank you for uh, for coming up and talking to us. Tell me about this song. Uh, well, it's a traditional honor song that we have down home um, in Cape Breton. And it is the Mi'kmaq honor song, which we perform at ceremonies, powwows, anything that really has to do with celebrating. Yeah. And it's usually played in the beginning of the event. Why did you want to be here today? Why is this an important day for you? Um, well, truth and reconciliation, for one, like, it's, it's a big day all across Canada, mm -hmm. and we fought so hard to get it. And it was an amazing opportunity to come up here to the capital and make sure that everyone knows we're still here. Yeah. What did you make of some of the, I don't know if you know any survivors or have any in your family, but what did you make of some of what we heard from the people who were at residential schools and are still living with a lot of that trauma? It's very tough, like, hearing their stories and everything kind of, like, hits you in the gut, <laughs> makes you want to cry. But um, it's just, it's a lot. Yeah. And I feel so sorry for everybody who was gone. Yeah. And even when they're long gone, they're, the f generations down the line are also going to be suffering. Tell me about your drum. Um, my drum, it's, 
a drum that was gifted to me from my aunt. Um, it has my name on it with little butterflies. The butterflies are from my clan. We are the Butterfly Clan. And the top says Budli Skij, which is Blackbird and Mi'kmaq. Mm -hmm. And this drum was given to me because of my rendition of Blackbird by Paul McCartney. Yeah. And then I have the red dress because I'm a very big advocate of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Movement. What were you thinking about today when you were up there performing the, the honor song? Don't mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> you did not mess it up. <laughs> that you know of. It's true. I, I didn't understand it. So I, I don't know. You, you would fooled me. Um, what would you like people to be thinking about today? Because this is, as I said, this isn't just a day when Indigenous peoples need to be thinking about reconciliation. We all do. Um, to be honest, the only thing I'm thinking about is like how much more they, they have to do in the future. Yep. Because this, like just, just having a day isn't enough. Yeah. They need to show more and do more. Emma, nice to meet you. I've been a fan since you did the Blackbird song, and Paul McCartney's a fan too, so you're in good yeah. company. Thank you. Nice to meet you. You too. Okay, safe travels home. It's Emma Stevens, Mi'kmaq singer, who was uh, on stage for this National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, only the third one ever in this country. Of course, before that, uh, it was commonly called Orange Shirt Day back in 2013, but now it has become a statutory federal holiday that was part of uh, the TRC's recommendations, calls to action was to actually create this day to think about um, what happened in this country. Um, let's bring in Olivia Stefanovic. She's standing by with a special guest, Olivia. Thank you so much, Rosie. I'm joined now but with Natan Obed, president of the Inuit Tepari Kanatomy. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm wondering if you can share your thoughts on this day. Well, first, we just saw such a powerful ceremony. First Nations, Inuit and Métis residential school survivors, leaders, and um, you know, heard so many very powerful truths about the residential school experience. So that's really what's in my heart at the moment. It's wonderful to see our leaders stand up and talk about resilience. It also is, re this is an important day to remember those who passed away, those who didn't make it through the residential school experience. And just how important it is to remember those lost students, those ones that didn't make it home in the work that we do today. We're still trying to change this country so that we don't have systemic racism, that we don't have education systems and healthcare systems and child welfare systems that systematically erase our culture, take our children away from our communities and perpetuate the same things that the residential school system tried to do. So it, it also lights a fire in me to continue the work that we do for self-determination for Inuit in this country, but also to learn from all of the powerful First Nations Inuit and Métis leaders that we heard from today and their experiences and their words to us. Governor General Mary Simon, who is the first Indigenous Governor General, she's Inuit, she mentioned that she thinks the education system needs to do a better job at educating Canadians about the full truth about this country. I'm wondering if you feel the same way and what you would like to see. In the work that I do in advocacy, I talk to so many Canadians. Um, and the first thing that I, we have to get beyond is the lack of knowledge. And I'll say ignorance in the gentlest way possible that most Canadians have about First Nations, Inuit and Métis, and also the experiences of First Nations, Inuit and Métis in this country's history. Uh, these aren't just uh, things that, that, uh, that happen in a vacuum, these things Residential schools happen in Canada. The residential school history and the genocide that happened in this country to Indigenous peoples is part of Canada's history. And we shouldn't run away from that. And I think one of the strengths of this country is the willingness for Canadians to hear the truth about what actually happened in this country to First Nations, Inuit and Métis and demand better. Uh, we don't have to live within this space. And I think part of this um, national Day and the focus that the federal government has partially placed on this through this statutory holiday is to have these conversations but for a purpose, to make this country better, to make Canada stronger and the pride that First Nations and Métis can feel in that strengthening 
not only of um, our people and our rights and the implementation of our rights, but also the acknowledgement of what we have gone through to get here to this day. Thank you so much for joining us. Rosie, back to you. Thanks, Olivia. I appreciate that. Nice to hear some of Natan's uh, thoughts as we get to the end of this day. I want to bring up something, a word that we heard a lot, uh, Brett, through that ceremony, and that is uh, the word genocide, uh, because there have been sort of different levels of recognizing what happened or didn't happen. Uh, the House of Commons did uh, pass a unanimous motion calling on the government to recognize that the residential school system uh, was genocide. And of course, the Pope said that word as well. Um, I wonder whether you think that that is meaningful when it comes to progress on reconciliation. I do think it's meaningful, but I think it'll be more meaningful if there's some sort of official action connected sure. to this use of the word genocide. So you mentioned the motion that was passed by MPs in the House of Commons. This was a unanimous consent motion. Nobody said nay. And what the motion said was that it was calling on the government yeah. of Canada to designate what happened at residential schools as genocide. So they passed that call to action, but it hasn't actually been implemented by the Canadian government. So what would that mean if residential schools were officially labeled a genocide in some form. I don't know what that would look like. I think that would be a monumental step toward yeah. achieving truth. What, in about 30 seconds, what do, you, what do you think of the fact that we've gotten to this point, you know, the third annual day of National Truth and Reconciliation? Well, my biggest fear about this day is that it becomes a day not of political grandstanding, but a day of lip service that is accompanied by inaction. Sure the following morning. So this is a day for solemn reflection. It's a day to celebrate the resilience and achievements of survivors. But let's take a clear eyed look at the work that remains to be done. This is the first step. Tomorrow is when the work actually begins. And that work involves action. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard to face the truth. But that's what we have to do in the future. OK, thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad that you were here with us to help us with our coverage. A reminder, too, to some people who, who may think that this is a, a far and distant part of Canada's history. It is not. The last residential school closed in 1996, 27 years ago. And you saw the names of more than 4,000 children who didn't return from those schools. But it was also made clear today that, that that work continues to try and find all the people who went and all the children who were lost. Um, we thank you for watching this special coverage from Parliament Hill on the third National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. Remember, if you need help, there is a crisis line. Reach out um, and get that help when you need it. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Rosemary Barton. We'll leave you with some moments from today. Nigga.
Namasu Ke Mawi Dahonet Get me dead a manage Don't wait a big salty Nigga Masu Ge Abona Maru Bona Marul Dinech Don Kisuk de Liga Luxig Hula Sit Kahamuk Away, ya, hey, oh, away, away. 